Hi, Meredith. How are you? Hi, I'm doing well. How are you doing, Emma? I'm good. Thanks for being here with me. So That's I think everyone probably knows, but just in case, can you just tell us the quick rundown, what is Signal and how is it different from other tech companies and other communications platforms? A quick rundown is hard <laughs> on that one, but Signal is the most widely used actually private messaging service in the world. So it's core infrastructure for militaries, for governments, for boardrooms, for human rights workers, for journalists, for anyone who has something important to say that they could be at risk if it were disclosed, if it were surveilled, if it were used to classify and categorize them. Yeah. Uh, we're also a nonprofit. We are also coming, or we're, we're, we passed our 10 year anniversary. So we are, we're a lot of things, but you know, core infrastructure for private communication that has set the gold standard for encrypted comms for over a decade is maybe the shortest version I can come up with. Got it, and you said the most widely used. How many people are on Signal now? We don't give that number, but it's hundreds of millions. Hundreds of millions? Yeah. Okay. So you've been spending a lot of time in Europe recently. Um, what is bringing you here and what are your priorities here? Well, you know, communications networks in this day and age need to be global, right? Mm -hmm. I need to be able to place a call from Kingston, Jamaica to Helsinki, Finland, and I need that call to go through and that needs to be private and I need to have friends in both places who both use Signal and participate in our encryption or that call won't go through. So it's really important to us that we expand our global net network to remain a global platform and that we diversify our base of support and begin to understand the really vibrant tech ecosystems that have been happening and are only growing outside of Silicon Valley. Yeah, so when you look around the region here, um, what partners do you have your eye on? Who are you interested in working with? Well, you know, we are interested in growing privacy awareness. Mm -hmm. We are interested in letting people know that we have rewritten the stack, so to speak, up and down and open sourced a lot of that work. So if you're looking to implement privacy preserving tech for your communication service, we may have built something that you can reuse. And we're interested in really driving home the value of private communications in a world that is not getting less volatile to be diplomatic about it. Yeah, on that note, um, what do you see happening? Why is privacy so important right now and becoming even more important? Well, look, privacy has always been important. I think we have been lulled, bamboozled, mystified, whatever adjective we want to use into taking our eye off the ball. And I think we're in uh, what we might call on the internet the find out period in privacy, right? We've seen breach after breach after breach after breach, years of breaches. You store the data, it gets leaked. That's pretty much the rule. We have seen governments partnering with large tech companies to exfiltrate data, to use that for surveillance and nefarious ends. And if we're gonna get very real about it, there's a woman living in prison right now in the United States because Meta turned over her messages that showed she was accessing abortion care and dealing with the aftermath in the state of Nebraska after the Supreme Court ruled that states could make that illegal. So I think, you know, when we talk about privacy, a lot of times in the past I've heard reflexes like, look, that's for criminals, I don't have anything to hide. And one of the points we got to make now is, I would say most of the human rights organizations who rely on Signal for life or death communications are criminals in one or another state in the world because their work, the people they're representing, the causes they're representing, whether it be access to health care or LGBTQ rights or whatever else a state might decide to criminalize, have made them criminals. So this is not a static category and this is not a low stakes game and, you know, it is hard to swim against that stream because we have had about 30 years in tech where we've kind of taken our eye off that ball, where we have assumed that, you know, there's some magical tech, um, that there's some sort of magic in tech that is just created via innovation and, and that, that there isn't surveillance at the heart of this business model that pooling a huge amount of intimate data, unprecedented in human history, in the hands of a handful of companies who now control platform infrastructures, cloud infrastructures, et cetera, is somehow going to lead to 
beneficial outcomes. Um, and you know, now what we see is we have, we have a huge amount of very dangerous data that is leaked, that is breached, that is turned over to hostile actors in the hands of a handful of actors. And it's really time to pull the rug out from under this model and actually get back to real innovation, right? I'm tired of white la labeling cloud APIs and calling that a startup. I actually want to build tech. And there's a huge amount of tech over here to build that needs a business model. It needs to be capitalized. And it needs to exist if we're going to be able to live in a world where our digital tools actually respect us, respect democracies, and respect a livable future. Yeah, thank you. Well, a lot to come back to there, and let's talk about the business model more. But first, on this point about you know how someone using Signal could be criminalized anywhere. When you have that conversation with regulators around the world, are they receptive to your argument? Um, are they still very concerned about not being able to access information they feel they need? Well, look, I think, I think it depends on the regulator. I think a lot of times you're dealing, when you're talking with government folks generally, you're dealing with people who are already overworked, who have oftentimes a lot of insecurity, almost a lot of shame around their own lack of understanding of tech, and thus an unwillingness sometimes to ask the dumb questions, to approach these topics with open skepticism or... Oh, sorry, this did trip <laughs> me out. Um, <laughs> um, um, and, and who haven't actually thought through these implications. You know, when I talked to regulators in London, where we fought the online safety bill very hard, which would mandate a backdoor in encrypted communications, they didn't understand until I laid it out in many cases that backdooring signal in London also created a backdoor for Ukraine in the context where the Ukrainian military relies on signal. Because every point in a network touches every other point in a network. That's kind of the definition of a network. So you can't have a parochial law that gains you a handful of political points and only applies to your little district that isn't actually poisoning the well for everyone. And this has been a challenge for tech regulation generally, but is a particular existential threat on a lot of these laws that seem well-meaning. You know, let the good guys look in to see what the bad guys are doing, and thus the world is healed. That's a you know, very simplistic argument to begin with, and it doesn't work when we're talking about encryption, when we're talking about these fundamentally undermining backdoors that are being proposed. Yeah. Um, what impact have you seen of that legislation in the UK? Have you seen those concerns about privacy that you warned about? Well, you know, there's a long story. It's fairly boring. Uh, we got this sort of very awkward compromise where basically um, scanning could be permitted if and the subjunctive is doing a lot of heavy lifting here for the grammar nerds, could be permitted if it were found to be technically feasible without undermining privacy, which is a kind of total, you know, it's a weird contradiction, but that technically feasible is really important there because ultimately it's not feasible ever. You know, Apple tried to build this, they had to pull it off the market because it was clear actually this creates a core vulnerability. So we got a weird, I don't, I think British people have described this to me as a very British type of thing, as you sort of like, no one has to lose face, you just have a very self-contradictory paragraph in the middle of the law. Um, and then there's a bunch of other, there's a bunch of other items in the Online Safety Act that have frankly given Ofcom, the regulator tasked with enforcing them, a lot of headache and a lot of work to do. Yeah, interesting. Um, well, let's talk more about the business model. So you have built this business model at Signal that you describe as kind of the antithesis of what you call the surveillance business model in big tech. So we have a lot of founders here. When you look at what they're building, what are some lessons from Signal that could apply to people building companies today? Yeah. I mean, I love, like, you just presented this. It's a, <laughs> it's a very grand vision, right? And in some sense it is, but, like, it's also pretty cut and dry, like we are very mission focused. We will not collect data. We have again solved a number of novel cryptographic problems, introduced new tech into the ecosystem in order to collect as close to zero data as possible. That's our focus, that's our obsession, that's what we do. And then the business model for tech is monetizing data, right? 
So you collect data, you build models to sell ads, or you train your AI model, or you are a data broker or something, you, you launch a you know, face matching app, and then you sell that data to the military, whatever it is, right? That's how you make money, or you provide goods and services for those who do. So, all right, if I was a for-profit, if Signal were a for-profit, and I had a board, say like Twitter's board, that had a fiduciary duty, at some point, it doesn't matter how good their hearts are, how bad they feel, they're going to have to force us to make some profit. And so we're in an ecosystem where profit making, under the current incentive structures that exist, are fundamentally opposed to the entire thing we do, our whole deal, right? Which to me, that's an acid test for just how toxic this incentive model has become. Like, we're doing real innovation. We're creating new things, we're solving real problems. And somehow there's only one of us in like, this area where real innovation could happen, where there's so many problems that need to be solved, can't get capitalized. Like, we can't actually figure out a business model for that because tech has been free so long and consolidation has taken such a toll on what we call tech, on this computational paradigm, this, this internet paradigm, that we're kind of locked into a sclerotic model that isn't actually solving new problems. It's just white labeling this, you know, a handful of cloud services and calling it innovation in many cases. And I, I, I don't want to drag any of the startups. Like, I know people are doing incredible work, but anyone who's doing incredible work knows this is a problem, right? And the problem we need to solve right quick is how we capitalize and sustain all of the things we need that aren't being built because this model has sucked all the wind out of tech sales. And so in the short term, what we need for Signal are donors, our sustainers, our people to pony up. Because it costs us about $50 million a year to run Signal, really cheap for tech. But you know, we don't have a profit model to fund that. So you know, for example, we are, you know, we're used by most government officials I meet use Signal, most militaries use Signal, boardrooms use Signal, everyone uses Signal. There's this massive military tech boom right now that's being really highly capitalized, really highly valued. We're core infrastructure. We've been there. We're one of the most important services across different militaries. And somehow we can't figure out how to get paid for that, again, because this model doesn't make sense. So like, that's not just a problem for Signal. We drop the bottom out of private communications in the world. We're down a very drastically dark path. And I think we need to take that seriously and actually begin to, in the short term, just make sure we can continue innovating and sustaining. In the longer term, we need to build another model. This doesn't work, right? Three cloud companies have 70, 70% of the global market. That means a handful of boards, a handful of people have an on-off switch for the infrastructure of computation across the globe. That is not sustainable. And I think, you know, speaking in Europe, that would hit a little different than it would hit in Palo Alto. But nonetheless, nobody who has a functioning intellectual faculty would look at that and say, like, that's chill, right? Yeah, so we are here in Europe, so when you look at the choices that companies here can make, whether it's compute, whether it's funding, where do you think they should be looking other than Silicon Valley? Do you think companies here should be exploring other options and building differently? I mean, absolutely. Again, there's a, this is where the party is. This is where it's actually interesting. This is where the cool, smart people who I used to meet in the cafeteria at Google in like mid-2000s are, you know, are and are interested. And I think there are, you know, there's a lot of work, a lot of very interesting work to do, whether it be solving some of the core vulnerabilities in AI models that are right now unremediable, and we're kind of just ignoring data extraction attacks, the supply chain uh, attacks that can happen around data poisoning, like catastrophic vulnerabilities that aren't really getting the attention they need, again, because they're inconvenient to this market. I think there's a huge amount of investment in smaller AI models that could be really interesting. And I don't just mean like homomorphic encryption use it on the device. I mean like there's a lot of problems in machine learning and AI that are getting no funding because they don't redound to this bigger is better scale is all we need approach. I think there is a, a massive opportunity I hear never whispered, but is huge around actually investing in methodologies to create better data. 
Right now, we're repurposing really crappy data in many cases, like ads data, data gathered from like bad sensors that the OS has never updated, it's not even fungible with other data, et cetera, et cetera, that wasn't collected for particular highly sensitive purposes and thus isn't actually useful when you train a model and deploy it in, say, clinical environments or other high-risk environments. There's an entire landscape of problems that, again, don't get addressed and don't get funded because we've sort of drank the Kool-Aid around bigger is better, and the only model that makes sense is a model that just happens to redound to the benefit of the incumbents in tech. And then, of course, we need to innovate on privacy. It's not natural that our entire lives become the you know, fodder for ad tech and surveillance companies. There's nothing natural about how tech develops. This is a contingency that has very historical roots in the 1990s and a handful of decisions made by the Clinton administration. Like, we can take some of that back, and by demanding that tech actually respects us, respects our privacy, respects our rights, we open up a massive opportunity for solving real problems that are actually interested that just happen not to have been addressed by this model. And Signal shows it can be done. Like, you know, it's possible. Look, we're here. Mm -hmm. You mentioned some of these fundamental problems in AI. So from your perspective, is there a way to build that you would consider ethical in AI right now? I mean, look, ethics aren't just a question of tech. Who's building? Who's using? Who is applying it on whom? For what purpose? How is it governed? What is the data that's used? Is the data actually representative of the reality it claims to represent? How are inferences produced? I, I think there is a, you know, I, I, sure it's possible, but what are we really talking about, right? Because there's no checklist McKinsey formula that's going to lead you to ethical AI and then you just you know, put that model out on the market and don't look at it again, right? We're talking about power structures. We're talking about who gets to define who else and what the consequences of that are. And that's a, you know, this is again how AI kind of slips into non-technical discussion very quickly because if you brand something intelligence, you give it the power of intelligence and you're doing something pretty big in the world you have to uh, take responsibility for. Yeah, you know, generative AI has, of course, been described as this, like, revolutionary inflection point, and you've said you don't see it that way, so what do you see it as? I mean, revolutionary inflection point is just, it's a lot of big words, you know? Yeah. Like, cool. I think transformers are, a, they're a great, um, you know, they're actually a huge efficiency game, right? Generative AI is really neat. It's like, you know, it's cool. It can do stuff. Right, but the market fit is wobbling, and that's very really clear to anyone. Like, there's, you know, the consumer market has not really materialized, and that doesn't mean it's not neat. That doesn't mean we don't all love an email prompt, although I don't use it. But, you know, what it means is that you cannot promise God and spend a trillion dollars on servers and then offer a subscription-based email prompt. Right, like that is not a mark. That the, the math is not mathing. And I think that what we're seeing is the, you know, the massive capital that has gone in by these big incumbents has not been realized in terms of revenue. And you know, they're buying time, they're trying to figure out how to extend that. I think that explains a lot of the turn to defense tech and some of the you know, trying to get more secure contracts on that. And again, it doesn't mean it's not useful, but what it means is that I don't think it's offering the gains that, um, you know, that people were so confident about a couple of years ago. Interesting. So you've said several times that Signal sees a lot of activity, a lot of new signups um, in these moments of political instability. So what have you seen since the election in the US? Yeah, we've seen a lot of growth. I mean, we've seen a lot of growth across the board, but I think it's, you know, at moments where people are unsure what those in power may or may not do and how that may affect them, I think that's when privacy comes home to be a lived value, right? When you feel it in your body, instead of this sort of abstract notion that generally means a terms of service you don't read or like a vacuum where no data and information exists, you realize like, oh, this is about what those who have power over me can do if they're able to access certain sensitive information and how that access is determined. Do I have agency over that, or is that access given by a large company? 
Do I have agency to say, no, you're not allowed to define me. You're not allowed to create data about me. I don't want you to be the one who gets to say who I am and what category I fit into. Or is that something that is foreclosed? And I think there's, you know, there's a deeper conversation about privacy that needs to do away with a lot of the legalistic constructs and a lot of, you know, the sort of technocratic notion of privacy is simply data protection and really look at, like, why has this been defined as a fundamental human right? Why is it so important? And what have we given up by not keeping our eye on it over the last 30 or so years as tech developed? Yeah, just on like a basic level, why do you think that we gave up on that so quickly? What was it that allowed people to kind of forget about that fundamental right, as you said? Well, look, I don't think we were actually given a choice. If you look back at the history here, and this is some, I've spent some time with this, you look at, in the 1990s in the US, there was a big push to commercialize the internet. Of course, it succeeded, we're all here. But there was a couple of decisions that were made by the Clinton administration in defining the rules of the road for the commercial internet. And there were two that I've called their original sins, and they go together. One was no privacy law, no restrictions on corporate surveillance. So governments had a lot more restrictions than any company. They could surveil, they could collect all the data. And the second was endorsing advertising as the economic engine of the internet. And that matters because advertising impels you to know your customer, right? So if you're competing in that ecosystem, you're trying to know and know and know and know, and know more so you can have the better ads, so you can sell that to advertisers, so you can target better, et cetera. So there's a flywheel that was created that then pop populated through platforms. There were network effects and economies of scale during that period that created you know, a center of gravity in the US, which had historical roots in you know, the mid-century and the investment in computation during the Cold War. There's a lot there that, you know, again, this wasn't natural. This is all contingent. And then we were told that the birth of the internet and tech was a product of innovation. That you know, in this neoliberal paradigm, that companies would be better stewards of data than governments because they were more efficient, they were more beholden to a customer base, et cetera, et cetera. Some true, some not. But you know, ultimately, we greenlit this you know, based on a handful of mythologies and hopes and perhaps a lack of understanding of the collateral consequences, although you know, there was a lot of contemporary scholarship and reporting in the 90s that were warning of just this thing, so I don't totally buy that. Um, I would look at Matt, Matthew Crane's work in a book called Profit Over Privacy, has a great rundown of this period. Um, but we were never given that choice. These tools were introduced, and then suddenly you're going to college in the mid-2000s, and you can't participate in your college life without a Microsoft Hotmail account, that you're, you know, the enterprise account. You can't actually navigate you know, what you're doing without that. You can't get a job without signing up online, right? So these, aren't, you know, these were sedimentary layers of infrastructures that were introduced into our social, political, and public lives as utilities, almost, that foreclosed the old ways of doing things that we now no longer have access to. And at this point, we're not talking about a choice where we gave up privacy, right? I don't click through on a terms of service and go through because I'm lazy. I do that because I really have no choice. I have to you know, get to that web page to sign up for my benefits, to apply for a job, to you know, get into Slush and download the app. So this was not something that we ever had a real public debate about. This was something that was sort of snuck through via technocratic stories and paradigms on the backs of you know, a Clinton era imperative to find a way to revive the US economy that didn't revert to what they called socialism, which would be redistributive policies that could sort of kickstart the economy that were very out of favor in the 90s, um, given the, you know, given that neoliberal, neoliberal zeitgeist. Yeah, well, what does this all mean for Signal? You've said there are lots of potential futures on the table. You know, you're really positive on Europe. Is there a world where you move? What does this mean for where Signal goes? I mean, we have no plans to, you know, we're, we're a remote organization already, but we are a, we are, we are firmly committed to a world where every person can pick up their device and easily communicate privately using Signal without any problem. 
So our, our commitment, my commitment, is to ensure that Signal thrives and survives, that it sustains, that we move through the next 10 years and get to that future, that we work with people who are similarly minded to think about you know, what is an actual model for sustainability that gets us out of this trap, this sort of you know, bad incentive structure that has shaped tech in a way that is not innovating, that is not interesting, that is actually dangerous, and that we rally people who support this cause, who have capital, who understand just how important Signal is and that you could not rebuild Signal in this era. You can't sell the first telephone. The network effect, the reputation, the tech stack, all of that emerged at a very different era. We need to protect it. And that they can you know, come forward and in the short term help support Signal. Because again, we're not a nonprofit because we think it's cute. We're fitting ourselves into a really weird shape that is really inconvenient, frankly, to move at the velocity we have to move at. But that is the only shape that will keep us and our mission safe until we change this paradigm. So in the short term, we need donors, we need people to step up and support. In the long term, we need to take very seriously fixing this model so we can actually have fun again. Thank you so much, Meredith. Thank you. <laughs>